you have to step away, if your internet gets, you know, wonky, we want to make sure people have access to this. Um, and so this is really for you. This, this recording isn't being shared um, widely. All right, let me just put this in presentation mode. But we're going to put the recording on the PH Learn Link website so that if you have um, any questions or want to go back to stuff, sometimes you won't do a training for a few months, you'll be able to watch the recording. Okay, so I'm just putting this in slide mode and, and I usually have to change one thing on my end. Uh -huh. So you don't see that timer, which is always kind of bizarre. Okay. Perfect. Can everyone just see a cover slide overview of Train the Trainer? Okay, in Pearl. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, as I said, I'm Leslie Steinman. I'm going to be your trainer today. Um, but I want to kick us off with getting to know each other. So I'll call out folks around the room. Um, and when you introduce yourself, if you can please let us know your name, your pronouns, what organization you're from, um, and I guess where you are, since you're around the country, um, and the communities you serve. That will help us to get to know each other, but also really try to tailor some of the training and the stories um, that we'll be sharing. I'd also love to know one thing you hope to get out of this trainer training. What brought you to the Zoom room today? Uh, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, and then I can introduce myself after we go around the room. Um, so let's start. I'm going to start with who's on my screen first. So Jennifer, let's start with you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lee. I'm in Southern California, and I'm with the Council on Aging Southern California. I'm a program manager here for Pearls. I've been working um, here as a coach uh, for Pearls for the last 14 months. Um, I think the next question was, why did I decide to participate in this great opportunity? Well, the main reason is that in my role, I wanted to be able to go more in depth, understand, and probably recap in case there are things that I had forgotten from the original coach training, and so that I could be a better resource to my team as we onboard new uh, coaches, or train the existing coaches and, and guide. I just hope to be a better resource to them. So I'm looking forward to the series that I, um, the train the trainers will provide and, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. Did I miss anything, Leslie? No, you nailed it, Jennifer. And you know, we often hear that as people learn to be Pearl's trainers, it's this awesome refresher of your own Pearl skills. So um, glad to hear that that's one of your goals for, for this, this series and training. Great, Jennifer, nice to see you. All right, let's see. Next I have on my screen, um, I have Gloria and Naya. Um, hi everyone. It is um, my name is Gloria, and I'm here with my colleague Naya as well. Um, I am my pronouns are she and her, um, and we're with the Council on Aging in Sonoma County um, in California. So um, we serve older adults um, here in our county, um, providing meals on wheels, fiduciary services, opportunities to socialize with um, other people because a lot of our our population tends to be lonely, so Council on Aging offers a few um, groups or services um, for older adults that are experiencing loneliness or social isolation, including pearls. Um, what I hope to get from the, this training, um, like Jennifer said, um, kind of another perspective on how to um, train our current staff, but also um, it'll be a really good opportunity to train new staff that are coming on board or possibly new coaches um, in other organizations. So also really excited to just get another refresher and get like more in depth into pearls from a different perspective. Awesome, thanks so much. And yes, thank you. Um, I love thinking about how the training can support both your current team as well as new folks that will come on board, which is inevitable in the social service space, um, both expanding and turnover. So welcome. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Naya. My pronouns are she, her. Um, half of my questions already got answered for me. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> um, and 
Why I am here today, I am hoping to just deepen my understanding of pearls, um, learn a little bit more about the research that I'm a very research person. Um, that way it helps me understand and be able to explain better to others on um, how pearls can help our older adult population. Oh, very cool, Naya. We have revamped a little bit how we teach research for today's training. Um, so perfect opportunity to have somebody keen on research to, to share how it works and how it lands and welcome your feedback. <laughs> awesome. How about Kelsey? Hi, I'm Kelsey Storms, um, pronouns she, her. I'm from Ohio, so the opposite side of the country here. Um, so it is afternoon here. Um, I'm with Butler Behavioral Health Services, so a little bit unique. Our uplift, our Pearls model program is actually run through the mental, our mental health agency. So we primarily do all the assessments for our 60 and up that come into the agency and see if they'll be appropriate for Pearls or not. Um, been doing it for four years. We are at a point where, you know, we'd like to see more services for our seniors um, groups as well. So the opportunity to get to know how to do training other staff or interns. We're very big on continuing education with the younger generations, especially ones that are passionate about serving older adults. Um, so that's kind of where we're going and where we're excited about going. Awesome. Welcome, Kelsey. And yes, excited to have. I feel like Pearls historically has not been done as part of behavioral health care and really more social services, but I agree. It's such an awesome model and particularly excited about getting younger folks and interns trained up and excited. We hear all the time that when people are studying, they want to have real tangible tools in their toolbox and, and Pearls can be learned pretty fast and applied pretty quickly. So I love that that's, that's part of the goal. Welcome. And my mom's a Buckeye, so great to have another Buckeye in the room from Ohio. <laughs> All right, Nicole, you're up next. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole Ed Hines, and I work for Knut Nelson Walker Methodist, and we are in central rural Minnesota. And um, we serve the older population. Um, we introduced the Pearls program I want to say about a year ago, and it's um, we have a couple of people doing it. So, and the other one is Teresa, who's on this as well. And um, we're finding that the last year, the program itself has gone really well, and we're seeing a lot of people benefit from the Pearls program. So, with um, the two of us being the coaches, um, it just makes sense as we grow to have us do the training so that we can continue to grow because uh, like I said, we've had really good results. So I think that the program where we're working is just going to keep growing and that's exciting. So um, what I hope to learn from the training is just um, enhance my skills that I already have. Um, I've had uh, well over 10 or whatever clients enroll and be served through the program. So just excited to expand um, and just keep going with it. So nice. Awesome. Awesome, Nicole. Thank you. And it's exciting to have you here from rural parts of the, the country. We we historically were in kind of more metro areas. So really exciting about Canoe Nelson starting yeah. pearls and and yes, about you and Teresa growing uh, in your area. Yeah. So Teresa, or Teresa, why don't you start next and please correct how I pronounced your name. I think I might have jumbled it there. <laughs> no, it's it's Teresa. No worries. Everyone okay. struggles with the spelling. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm Teresa Mortensen. I um, work with Nicole as the uh, director of our behavioral health. So we too are implementing pearls as a part of behavioral health as uh, obviously more of a preventative measure. Um, we have recently merged with another agency, so we're Canute Nelson Walker Methodist, so we've essentially doubled in size, um, not only employee and, and client-wise, but also territory, so I am excited because I think we're going to be expanding in a lot more regions 
Um, and so we need a lot more people brain to do pearls. Um, I guess I should back up. My pronouns are she, her. And what I hope to learn today is just um, the skills that will really help me as I try to mentor and bring on new people. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Teresa. And super exciting about your growth as an organization. Um, I know that can sometimes come with growing pain. So pumped that Pearls is going to be a tool in your toolbox. I'm excited to learn, I think, from, from you and also Nicole in terms of like how Pearls maybe gets integrated differently within a behavioral health environment. So we're going to be talking a lot about implementation in the last few webinars, um, but excited to have some diversity of, of organizations at the table. Welcome. Next, I'm gonna punt to Michelle. Hi everyone, my name's Michelle Strait. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm on the Pearls team at UW uh, in Seattle. So I kind of am helping to serve all of you guys essentially just on our end with the research and the evaluation. Um, but I'm really interested in learning just kind of this next aspect of Pearls and kind of you know getting more into this nitty gritty part of it. Um, and just excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. And many of you may have met Michelle because she does an amazing job managing the online training and the practice sessions. And so we're pumped. She has a social work background, so we're pumped that she's going to add training to, to her toolbox as well. So welcome, Michelle. Um, and Sandy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandy, she, her, hers. I'm currently with Cambodian Association of America in Long Beach, um, but I am involved in many different organizations. So I'm just uh, trying to build capacity for the community right now. I just started working closely with the Cambodian community within the last three years. And, you know, this is fairly new to them in a way where I'm trying to culturally explain in <laughs> Uh, Cambodian language. So it's pretty cool. It's challenging at the same time. Um, I'm here because, you know, I just received the training back of, in June, I believe, and I'm trying to go ham with it. And I want to basically just build my capacity and, you know, stay in the know and the why and have my little support network so I don't feel as alone. I am the only coach at CAA. Mm -hmm. So it's exhausting, but um, mm -hmm. so I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sandy. I love the idea of trainer training as helping to support you all so that you can train up more people and not be the only one wearing this hat at your organization or in your community. So, so thank you for being here. Um, Sandy, I work on some projects in Cambodia with Pearls and other programs. So happy to talk offline about uh, some of the work you're doing. Really excited that you're serving that community who's really been historically underserved by this work. So welcome. Did I miss anybody besides Kellyanne and I? I think I've got everyone. Let me just double check. Okay, cool. So I'm Leslie. I've met many of you um, on technical assistance calls or on email or other trainings. It is an absolute thrill to be one of your trainers for the trainer training. This is truly one of the favorite parts of the work that I do. I love getting to know people doing this work. I love learning with you and training is how we do that. Um, so I'm actually a researcher by training um, within public health and social work. Um, but I see research as a way to help us do our work better and to help really bring to light all the stories of pearls that you all are doing in your communities, whether it's the impact, whether it's the ways you're adapting it to make it work better. Um, so that's what our pearls team does. And that's part of why I'm a trainer, because we create that kind of network or feedback loop or community of practice, really, that helps us do our work best. You're going to have several trainers over the course of the next seven weeks together. I, I, I feel really privileged to be one of them. And I'm going to have uh, one of my other trainers introduce herself who will be behind the scenes today um, managing, but will be training in a few weeks. Um, I also use she, her pronouns. And for me, what I hope is just to learn from you. Um, I always learn something with different groups. And so excited to see how this group sells and learns and critiques gently. Um, so exciting for that. Kellyanne? Hi, everyone. I think I know most of you or have traded emails with many of you. Uh, I'm Kellyanne Hara Hubbard. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a research coordinator. Um, work closely with Leslie. Uh, 
ditto everything Leslie said. I don't know that I can say it any better than that. Like part of the reason that I love doing this work and working specifically on pearls is because I get to meet all of you and hear about all of the incredible work that you all uh, do in your communities and with your communities and, and all of the incredible programs and ways that you're just thinking and pushing and continuing to to do more to support all of the, the people that we live and work with. So grateful to be here and, and grateful to get to be a part of this group. Awesome. Thank you, Kellyanne. And I'm realizing I did not do any um, Zoom housekeeping to kick us off today. I think we're also used to Zoom, but I just want to make sure folks know we are recording just for you. We're not going to share it out, but it's so you have access to it. Um, we love to see you, but if at any point you need to eat, you need to drive, whatnot, totally fine. Go off camera. Um, we're a small group, so just chime in. You don't need to raise your hand. Um, just chime in if you have questions, or um, I'll also be monitoring the chat with Kellyanne. So if it's easier to type while talking, that's that's cool too. Um, any other housekeeping norms, Kellyanne, that I missed? Um, just if you run into any tech issues for any reason, feel free to either come off mute or message me. I'm happy to troubleshoot and figure out what's going on. Okay, very cool. Yeah, thank you. And then just a reminder, yes, this is a training, but you're not supposed to know everything, nor do I. So as one of our, our great colleagues, Amy says, you know, say it messy. If there's no right or wrong questions. If you're struggling with something or have a thought about something, please share. Um, we want this to be a training where you get the most out of it, thinking about how to apply this. To your work. Okay, cool. So I'm going to start then uh, advancing some of the slides and tell you um, what the goal of the training is today. So there's a couple things we're going to do today. Um, I want to make sure that you all know about an overview and goals of what this trainer training is all about. You, know, you read about it on the website, but I want to make sure you're clear on what the requirements are for becoming a trainer and what the post-training guidelines will look like. Um, I'm going to spend a little time describing what an in-person pearls training looks like and how to introduce the training to trainees. I will say this train the trainer is really geared towards in-person training, but since we now have an online training, we'll be talking about that a little bit today and throughout. So I know some of you were trained in person, some of you were trained online, so I'll do the best I can bridging them, but if you have any kind of questions or concerns around in-person versus online, do, do let me know. Um, and really what um, I would love for you to have at the end of the day is also some tools to start training others. So you're going to learn today kind of what are the key pieces of pearls? What is the rationale behind pearls? Where do pearls come from? Um, and what is some of that evidence base um, to talk about pearls, both in terms of its effectiveness as well as how it's delivered? So first, let's talk about this train the trainer course that you've all shown up for. Um, so really the goal of the course is to train people like you, people who have experience with pearls, uh, to train others to do pearls. Um, and we've broken it up in 90-minute weekly webinars, so we'll be together the next seven weeks. Um, and here you can see the schedule. Um, we've left a lot of time at the end to talk about implementation and beyond because it can, it can be a pretty big um, topic. Um, but know that we'll be talking about implementation throughout as we talk about examples of what PEARLS looks like in the field. So each webinar will have a couple things. We'll give you some learning objectives. We'll talk a little bit about principles of adult learning that we've tried to incorporate into our training, and we hope that you will as well as you train others. We'll talk about each topic that we'll be training. We'll have some frequently asked questions and give you lots of time to ask questions as well. And then we'll do something called a teach back, which is where at each webinar we'll have two of you volunteer to teach us what you've learned. Um, we would like everybody to do this at least once um, and know that you will have your slides, you'll have your materials, you'll have some time to prep. So we really want this to be a way to kind of jump in and try it and get feedback from the group. So our requirements, we'd love for you to be here for at least six of the seven live Zoom webinars. We love you all seven, but we know that you wear many hats, sicknesses come up, et cetera. Um, we'd also love you to participate, whether that means jumping in and volunteering, um, asking questions in the chat, maybe sharing a different experience of what we're talking about, whatever active looks and feels comfortable to you. 
And then we'll have just a little bit, hopefully, of homework in between webinars. And this is just a way for us to know you're learning what we hope you learn. So there'll be a quick, probably four question, multiple choice quiz after each webinar. There'll be some brief videos of past training so you can get a sense of how other people have taught the skills before. And then uh, some brief review of a toolkit or a handout, something that we're going to be talking about. And the homework's meant to help you, and it's also meant to help us know that we're teaching the key pieces so we can strengthen the training um, and address things that we may not be teaching as effectively in future webinars. In terms of what happens after the Train the Trainer, you're going to have access to the website on PH Learn Link, and that'll give you the recording, the slides, and the other materials that we'll be discussing during the training. Ideally, we'd love it if you can do a training with somebody else within six months after the training. So maybe that's an in-person training. Some of you are from the same agency and doing an in-person training for your current staff or even other people out in the community. Or maybe that's jumping on one of our Zoom practice sessions where you basically help newly trained um, people from the online training practice their parole skills. We also invite, um, want to invite you as well as the people you train to be part of our community of practice. So we facilitate, Michelle and Kellyanne and um, Caitlin and, Tori and Tony and I, we facilitate monthly Thursday technical assistance calls for Thursday of the month. We'd love it if people you train join. They don't have to. As you know, no one's required. But if they've got questions or want to build community with other PEARLS programs, we'd love to get their emails and invite them to join. Um, we also have, uh, as you know, copyrighted materials that you have access to. These are the forms, these are the toolkit, and things like that. And I want to be clear that the way Pearl does it, this is different than other evidence-based programs, is we just offer a certificate for training, basically to show you've done the work, you've shown the skills, and you now can train others. We don't have a licensing model. We've tried to not do that to make it easier for you to do Pearls and expand Pearls. But it just looks a little different than I think some of the other programs where there's kind of annual fees or licensing required. Um, and then as I mentioned uh, previously, we're going to invite all of you to come join us on the online practice sessions. We always need, um, we always want and need more people to do that so we can offer more sessions. But we also find it's really great for trainees to hear from different trainers. So trainers who represent different backgrounds, who come from different types of organizations, who maybe have different professional training. And so it just really helps us enrich the training experience when we have folks um, with real diverse experiences join those. So you'll all be invited. And don't worry, we won't schedule it um, tomorrow. But it's something that um, you'll be likely hearing from Michelle about after the training. <laughs> so in terms of PH Learn Link, please let us know if you are having any difficulty accessing or navigating this site. This is, this is your site. It's meant to have all the things you need uh, to prepare for the training and then after the training. So you'll see the, the recording and slides, as I mentioned, materials, some videos. There's the learning assessment, AKA quiz, which we'll ask you to complete after today's training. It should just take five minutes. It's very brief. There's any homework we have, and then um, we do have a link to a, a document where we have lots of frequently asked questions because we won't be able to cover everything. We'll cover a lot, but it's nice to have that handy when people have different questions. And Kelsey, I see that you um, are saying your login is not working in the chat. So yes, we can, um, Kellyanne's putting it right there. That's how we'll, we'll solve it for you. Thank you for letting us know, and apologies that you didn't have access for today, but don't worry. There's nothing you have to do for today that we won't cover during the live discussion. Thank you for letting us know. Other resources, um, we have the slides. Like the slides I'm going to be covering today, those are all going to be on PH Learn Link. So in terms of taking notes, you'll have all of these. Um, we also have some handouts that we use during in-person training that really summarize pretty much everything I and other trainers are going to be discovering. We've got a mock schedule you can use for your two-day training just to save time on your end. And then there's the toolkit that you all, many of you have access as part of your own PEARLS work. So these are all um, available in, in the Google Drive for PEARLS. And then in terms of evaluation, so like how do we know that this worked for you? Um, during the training, I mentioned we'll do the quiz or learning assessment after each webinar. 
We'll be doing some teach back and frequently asked questions. And then at the very end of the seven week series, we're going to ask you to complete a post training evaluation. It's going to be a little more in depth because we're really going to try to gauge did you get the key points at each of the webinar series and how can we do better in teaching those points. So you'll get tailored feedback on any questions that you don't that you don't get because that really tells us we need to teach that more effectively. There'll also be a self eval that um, we'll ask you to fill out. Um, we're always learning. We're always trying to improve this trainer, train the trainer. To be honest, this came from the community. This, this train the trainer was not something we originally had when we started rolling out pearls. And we heard from partners that we want to be able to do this in house. We want to be able to build capacity locally. Um, and so this really came from you. And so it continues to improve with you. Um, and then after the trainer training, there'll be, um, there'll be an evaluation as well that you can give to your trainees. So when you're out in the field doing a training, there'll be an evaluation that you can give and get feedback on how you're doing. You're not required to share that with us, but that's really more for you to see, um, to see how your work is going and how you might improve going forward. And also get some testimonials for future trainings. So that's like kind of rapid fire what the train the trainer is. Are there any questions about materials I covered, what the plan is, what your expectations is for the next seven weeks? Okay. Well, let's dive in then to how you start a training. Um, so this is, for those of you who did the in-person training, this is going to look a lot like how you started off your training. For those of you who did the online training, it'll look similar, but there'll be a little bit of stage setting that'll be slightly different. So I just want to kind of give that disclaimer. Um, then this materials are covered in the toolkit in the background section, as well as um, in the trainer handout that's on PH Learn Link called Introduction. So this is an example of that schedule I talked about when you do a training. Um, this was a training that was done uh, recently in LA County that Caitlin and Kellyanne did with another trainer, Jennifer. And this just gives you an example of if you're planning a training, what you're going to cover each time, what are the key points, and who's going to do what. So this is one of the examples you'll get um, in your materials. So for today, I think really the adult learning principles we want to highlight are what are some tips for reaching adult learners. That's what you are, and that's what your Pearls trainees will be. We've really tried to design our Pearls training with these, with these tips in mind. So making the material immediately useful, you can go to a Pearls training on Thursday and Friday, and the idea is that you can hit the ground running on Monday. So there's the forms, and there's other tools that you can use right then and there. Um, it's really meant to be relevant. So we've tried to design this with your types of organizations and staff in mind, um, as well as the communities that you serve, who many of you in your introduction talked about the older communities being isolated, um, being depressed, and not having great access to care. We really encourage, whether you do this online or in person, to make the environment welcoming. So serving food, having breaks, having places for people to, um, to pump if they're nursing parents or to pray if they're observing a prayer time. So just making it really safe and welcoming and comfortable will make for a better learning environment. Um, ideally, your presentation should be engaging. So, you know, we're on Zoom, which means there's going to be a lot of slides. Uh, if you're in person, you could use flip charts. You could get that and move around the room, you know, really um, keeping people active in the training. Um, and then really making sure that we're being respectful in how we present our content. So I'm always learning. I don't know all the stories and all the expertise around pearls, and nor should you. But you should always be kind of welcoming of diverse perspectives, of different ways of applying the material, and make space for doing that during your training. And then lastly, really, it's all about making a connection. You know, what what pearl story can you draw on when you're teaching? So we all bring different stories of pearls to this work. So I don't know your stories, but I'm excited for when you're training for you to bring those stories into the training. And that's really why we try to only train people who have experience with Pearl to be trainers, because those stories are so rich in learning the tools and figuring out how you can apply it within your, your busy life at your organization. 
So I want to give everyone a heads up about today's teach back. So at the end of the trainer, uh, train the trainer, we're going to have two people volunteer. Um, and I would like one of you to describe what Pearls is using the house figure. And one of you to give us kind of a brief synopsis of Pearl's evidence and impact. You'll each have about five minutes. You don't have to decide now, but all of you should be listening for this. Um, and then when we get to it, um, I will welcome volunteers. So this will do towards the end of our hour and a half together. Okay, let's talk about how you start off a training. So the next slides are really gonna talk about how we set the stage for the training, how we introduce and welcome our trainees, how we talk about pearls using two metaphors. So there's the house and the stool as two ways we, we talk about the, the components of the program and then how you orient trainees to a training. So this is really geared towards in-person training. So first setting the stage, what we've really learned is one of the best ways to start off a training is to kind of locate this idea of why we need problem solving and activity planning within our daily lives. So asking your trainees to think about what happens in your life when you take two days away from home or from work to attend this training that you're at. Things pile up, you're wearing multiple hats, juggling multiple responsibilities. You're also probably multitasking, right? There's like a voicemail or an email or some fire you need to put out. And what would happen if in all this kind of complexity, you sort of feel um, just overwhelmed and almost like you're going through a mini crisis. And ask the trainees, what would you do if that crisis didn't stop, but just kind of kept building up and kept going? And in this case, we're asking your trainees and you to think about if problems are solved and they keep building and building, this is what many of our Pearl's clients experience. And so that feeling of overwhelm, that feeling of stuck, over these next two days of pearls training, you're going to learn these really practical, really active tools to help people learn how to reduce that mountain of stressors. So this kind of really helps like people embody and get in the moment of what you're going to be teaching and training um, just by imagining what it's like for you as a professional having to go and show up to the training. So we often start, start off the training with this kind of metaphor. Next, we have people go around and introduce themselves, just like we did today. Um, I think it's really valuable to hear what people want to get out of the training. It helps you kind of tailor and emphasize certain things. Um, and I'm noticing here, we don't say communities that are reached, but I do think that's a helpful piece. You can tailor introductions, though, based on who you're training. This might be a bunch of people you know, or it might be a bunch of people you don't know. And so building in icebreakers or things like that is totally appropriate. And then introducing yourself at the end after you've had a chance to hear from everybody. So next, we want to give trainees just a real brief what is Pearls. Some people will come into the room knowing absolutely nothing about the program. Some people would have gone, gone to the website. Maybe you've been doing it at your agency for a while, and so they've heard a little bit. But the really key thing we want to do is first let people know what it stands for. It stands for the Program to Encourage Active and Rewarding Lives. This is that positive kind of empowerment skills focus of PEARLS. The next thing we do as a way to really describe what PEARLS is, is we do a little bit of that stage setting that I described earlier, where we really ask people to first think about how is mental health care typically provided? Um, and this is where we, we often have flip charts, right? And we draw on the flip chart a client and their coach or their therapist or their other provider sitting in an office. And then we ask trainees to really brainstorm together what are the barriers to usual care? So what makes it hard to do what we traditionally think of as behavioral health care? And I know folks who are here representing behavioral health organizations, you've probably got a really good sense of that from being at those organizations. And then people who are at social service organizations, you've got a sense from just knowing from your community what makes it hard to access clinical care. Maybe it's transportation, maybe it's insurance, maybe the providers don't speak their language, but really kind of talking about the barriers to, to traditional clinic-based care. Next, we like to draw a house around that coach and that client to really try to show visually 
why it is that Pearls was brought initially into the home, but now is done in lots of different community settings. And it's actually even done like we're doing today on Zoom. But to really think together about what are the benefits of seeing clients in their home and, and to have people call it out. People can write on flip charts. They can scream it out. You can have them do a pair share and then talk. But really, it's a way to get trainees thinking about what were the barriers to clinical care? What are some of the ways that seeing people in homes can benefit? And that really sets the, the story for why Pearls was created. We're not going to do that brainstorming together today, but this is more how you would how you would start off. So what is Pearls? So you've drawn the house, right, to show kind of the value of going into people's homes. And next, the other visual or figure we use is this idea of Pearls as a stool that's sitting on a floor. And this stool has three really important legs or skills that it teaches. The first is problem-solving treatment, or PSP, which really teaches people the process of solving problems. So it's not that all problems will be resolved. It's that you now have a way to approach problems, to tackle them, and feel a sense of control, maybe less of a sense of hopelessness. And that's the, the piece that helps people be and feel less depressed. The second leg is behavioral activation, particularly planning physical, where you move your body, or social activities where you connect with others, because these have been shown individually to help people with their mood and their energy. Um, and if we plan these specific types of activities, they can, they can really function like antidepressants. The third leg is another form of behavioral activation that's called pleasant event scheduling. So these are helping people kind of identify and plan things that are enjoyable. Because often when we're depressed, we stop doing those things. So those three legs of the stool are the key pearls components. And then the really key piece is that it sits on this really stable foundation or floor, which is that clinical supervision. So that's the way that your uh, team is regularly connecting and consulting with a supervisor to make sure clients are getting the best care they can. And also make sure you're getting the best support you can as a pearls provider. So this may mean there's adjustments to care. This may mean that you're kind of problem solving, how to do problem solving. It may be seeing if somebody's eligible. So that's the Pearl tool. A couple of pieces to highlight when you're teaching that. One is that a client might choose to do some pieces. They may, you know, be really resistant to problem solving initially. It's kind of a very individualized way of approaching the world, this whole idea that I can control things. So sometimes you might start with BA, teaching problem solving slowly and maybe even planning an activity that the client faced a hurdle with using the problem solving steps. But we always want that floor there because that supports you, your coaches, and your clients. We also want to make sure we're clear that PEARLS is not some panacea. It is not the only way to treat depression. Um, and even though you're teaching trainees to do PEARLS and do it well, they should also have ideas of what else they might do if someone, if it's not enough or it's not a good fit for someone. I know that's easier said than done because sometimes PEARLS is truly the only thing available for older folks in your community. But just making sure we're not kind of overselling it as a solution and we have some plan Bs in place. And then the last piece I really want to make sure you learn and, and teach when you're training others is that everybody in the room brings their own experience and wisdom. And so you don't have to throw that all out when you're doing pearls. Pearls can feel very structured and very like regimented, but really it's meant to build on your existing skills. Um, and so you don't have to throw out kind of what you learned in school or how you are with clients, but we do want you to kind of follow this method and protocol and then you can supplement or complement it with those other experiences you have. So next, we like to give people kind of a, a snapshot of the PEARLS process um, so that they have a sense of what we're going to be covering over the series of the training. Um, we used to, in in-person training, not teach PEARLS very linear, linearly. We used to kind of start with the sessions and then go back to recruitment and screening. But what we heard from you all is that that was kind of disjointed. And it's, it's kind of better to just like follow the recipe from start to finish. So 
we will be in this train, the trainer, we will be starting, you know, once we today kind of give you this overview, we will, the next session will jump right into recruitment and screening. Um, so if this feels a little different than what you got, it's because we're, we're trying to be responsive to feedback that we've, that we've received from the community. In terms of materials that you'll want to have handy for the training, it's pretty similar to what you're having handy for, for this training. You know, you're going to have the toolkit. Some people print that out. A lot of people now are doing things more digitally. Um, but again, it's this idea where you have all the tools in one place to get started Monday morning. Um, during today's training and our next training sessions, we um, will reference some handouts. If you did an in-person training, you would have used these. These sometimes are printed color-coded to help people navigate them. But again, they don't have to be printed if you're doing training in a way that you want things to be digital. Um, the idea, though, is that the handouts are kind of quick, the slides are quick, uh, the toolkit can be pretty big, but it's meant to be like a reference, um, and we want people to have kind of some brief tools that they can use in the field um, right at the end of the training. In terms of what's covered in an in-person training, this is just a quick snapshot of what typically gets covered on day one, um, and it's basically pretty much the order in which we're going to be going through um, the materials over the next seven weeks together. But the first day is very much kind of where did pearls come from? What is it? Um, how do you recruit and screen folks? Um, what are the really, what are the key tools, the problem solving and behavioral activation and getting folks practicing? And then day two tends to be a lot more about implementation and the clinical supervision and self-harm piece. These are the objectives we've come up with for when people do a two-day in-person training. And I encourage you to you know, know your audience. You may find that you're training folks to bring a lot of experience, for example, screening and assessing for depression. And so maybe you don't need to spend as much time on the PHQ-9. Um, or maybe they already come with some experience doing problem solving. So it's okay to adjust this two-day schedule and objectives for your audience. We just want to make sure these are things that people know after the two days, whether they bring it to the table and show you they know it, or you're teaching it live. I've been, I do want to highlight just a little bit uh, the online training, since that's what some of you did, and some of you will be um, being a coach or a trainer for the online training. Um, it basically takes those two days and packs it into an online self-paced uh, training. So there's 11 modules that take those two days of content and put it into slides and demonstrations and quizzes. Um, and then what we, what we did is we decided to basically replace the multiple practices in an in-person training with this one 90-minute Zoom practice session. We encourage people to practice on their own, to practice with their peers, but we wanted to make sure there was at least one opportunity that you could come and trainees could come and practice. And sometimes people join more than once if they feel they want more practice. So going through the trainer training means that you all will be eligible to be the trainer in one of those sessions, um, and you basically are the client, and you've got six Earl trainees who are working as your coach, and you walk through a PHQ-9 and the problem solving and behavioral activation together. Um, I know that some folks may not be interested in that, so don't worry, it's not required, but it's a nice way to keep your skills up um, as well as to connect with others in the Pearl community. For the online training, it's really geared towards Pearl's coaches, but I know some of you, when you introduced yourself, said that you're managers and directors at your organization. Um, and so we have people go through the training who are interested in, in just knowing the content, but not necessarily delivering pearls in the field. We developed this training because people said they needed training more often. They needed it to be more accessible. It's really expensive to do in-person training when you have to travel. Um, and so that's really where this came from. And we are working on offering the training in other languages. Right now we have sessions available in Spanish and English, but we Part of why we want to train more trainers is it'll allow us to have more bilingual, bicultural trainers who can do the training in different languages. I will say um, it can be helpful as you're planning your training to think about kind of what do you need to have in place before training? So you all can decide like to put some 
boundaries when you're doing training, whether in person or even when we communicate with folks who sign up for the online training. Um, but really thinking through these key questions. You know, who, is, who are you going to train? Like, who's going to be your Pearl's coach? And then do you need someone to manage it? Do you um, need somebody to be a clinical supervisor? Do you have someone in-house? Thinking about how you're going to do outreach and actually identify participants can be super helpful before you train because we always hear that outreach and marketing and promotion and, like, building that up takes time. And so it's nice to even start doing that work before you head to training. Thinking about what data you need to track, both for your purposes um, and for the community, you know, what are folks going to want to know, and we'll be talking about data um, in later webinars. And then really, many of you are doing this with an existing funding, um, but figuring out kind of how this is going to be paid for. We unfortunately have a lot of folks come to training who then don't have great funding models. And even though the training is really great for skill building and might give you tools to help write that grant, um, it can be really helpful to think about, okay, what's going to pay for my time starting Monday, even if it's a few hours a week, to start with one client and just kind of build capacity for pearls, build those stories, build that impact, and then kind of apply for additional funding. So before I dive into the evidence, questions from the, the group about um, setting, you know, setting up an in-person training, what you typically cover within that first, you know, 30 minutes hour when you're orienting folks to the training? I have a question. Um, ideally, mm -hmm. would the two-day in-person training take place back to back, or could it be spread out over the course of a week or two? Oh, yeah, great question. I mean, historically, it was back to back two days. But what we heard is that you can spread it out if that's what's going to work best for your for your staff. So I think the model I've seen is what you you just suggested, where it's like you know Monday mornings for six weeks or something. You know, so it's not having to take a full day off of work. It is nice to have some frequency, so not doing it like once a month, for example. But it is we leave it to you to kind of integrate it into your existing trainings, and if it's done more of a weekly than a two long days, then that, that's totally fine. Yeah, great question. And I will say, if you do break it up like that, the advantages is you people might have some time to put things into practice. With the two days, it's just it's a lot, right? And so it's like you know intense boot camp, you know, and it's great because you learn a ton. Um, but if you ended up doing that, let's say, Monday morning model, you, you could give folks more homework around, you know, try giving a PhD 9 to one of your colleagues or, you know, try going through the problem-solving steps um, in advance. And so you could also do some of the practices that way. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Well, so the last section of today's training is really to talk a little bit about Pearl's evidence and impact. Um, so there's some of this in the toolkit. Um, there's also a handout which goes into a lot more detail about the research. Um, and then there is a link to our website, um, which Kellyanne, I can't remember if that's on the PH Learn Link page, but maybe if you can put that in the chat. Um, our website also provides an overview of some of the research and impact to date. Um, but really, your job as a trainer is not to be a researcher. That is not everybody's jam. Your job as a trainer when talking about Pearl's evidence and impact is to kind of situate where did Pearl's come from, what do we know about its evidence and what works, and what are we continuing to learn. So it, it's meant to give trainees like some credibility in terms of like this works and it's been happening for 20 years, but also to be really transparent about what we know and don't know. So this is a snapshot of 20 years of pearls in terms of some of the research we've done, as well as some of the tools we put in place to support you all. Um, so there's two types of research when we're talking about pearls. Um, one is called effectiveness research, which is really research to, to evaluate whether pearls works. Are people 
Um, are people getting less depressed? Are people feeling more connected? Is it effective? Just like is in, uh, medication effective that you're taking or some other health promotion program you're doing? The other type of research we do is something that's called dissemination and implementation research. It's also known as translational research. So I find that kind of a confusing name because when I think of translation, I think of translating from one language to another. But translational research is meant to say, okay, we've spent some time developing this thing. How do we get it into the hands of the people that need it and organizations like yours who do it? So that really focuses on things like how to improve, how the program's delivered, reaching more people, how it's sustained, et cetera. So in terms of why PEARLS, why was this program developed in the first place? Really, it's because older adults face inequities in the burden that they face with depression. So it's an it's a equity issue. It's an access to care issue. So we know depression is a leading cause of disability, and it has a huge impact on over older adults' quality of life, their function, their health, so kind of their health broadly, as well as how they manage other chronic illness. And it's a huge risk factor for preventable death, particularly suicide and self-harm. On average, and these numbers shift, about one in five older adults experience depression. Um, I actually recently saw a meta-analysis that put this higher at about one in three. I think rates are rising, um, but one in five is the kind of most common metric we see. But we know that this burden is really higher for older adults who are marginalized. So this includes people of color, queer older adults, people living in poverty, people in rural areas. Um, and unfortunately, despite us knowing what works, only one in 10 older adults actually receive adequate care for their depression. Hence PEARLS. PEARLS was really born from this inequity and community-based organizations coming to our center and saying, we think we can do this better. We think we can embed these programs in our social services as a way to really build capacity among community providers that are trusted, remove some of these physical, cultural, and financial barriers to care. So we talked a little bit earlier about things like transportation and insurance and people not speaking my language. So if you train up community providers who are accessible and look like the community, this provides a way to reduce some of those barriers. It's also something that when we develop PEARLS, we didn't use this term, but it's now used often, where we're really shifting tasks that were historically done by clinicians to trained providers who may not have clinical training, but then we link to clinical care, whether through the clinical supervisor or through primary care or especially mental health care. Social service agencies can also address some of those social drivers of mental health burden, so things like poor access to safe housing in neighborhoods or um, not great access to medical care, and then we know it aligns with what older adults want. Some older adults want to take a medication to manage their depression. Others really prefer to, to learn skills and learn tools they can apply. And I do want to shout out, this work really came from the community. So it was the director of our Area Agency on Aging here in Seattle that came to our center. And then we engaged folks from housing, from senior centers, uh, from a grandparents group, as well as from a leadership from the Black community. So the original Pearl study was really engaging older adults who are disconnected socially, who are living with multiple co-occurring chronic health issues, and who have physical and, and functional limitations that, that basically make them functionally head, uh, homebound. These folks are all more likely to be depressed, but they also are more likely to have poor access to care. So the study really targeted this underserved community. And we collaborated with aging social service agencies to really evaluate the effectiveness of this model called PEARLS. Um, we wanted to see, do we, do we identify folks with depression and can we help them manage their depression? And we particularly focused on minor depression and persi or persistent depressive disorder among low-income older adults. So why minor depression, which is a, a way of describing people who have uh, fewer depressive symptoms in their lives? Um, it turns out minor depression is just as impactful for older adults as major depression. So even though they have fewer symptoms, they're not doing the other things that keep them healthy, whether it's um, moving their body, connecting with others, getting outside, um, take, going to their doctor's visits to manage other health issues. 
So there was limited evidence on working with people with minor depression or with dysthymia or persistent depressive disorder, which is, which is like a more chronic kind of smoldering type of depression. We'll talk about a little more in the next webinar. So there's limited evidence, there's a huge burden, there's a huge impact on, on lives, and so that was kind of why we decided to focus initially there. It also felt more acceptable to our community partners who had not historically done mental health care. Here's who was in the original research. Um, so you can see on the right kind of the total and then who was in the PEARLS group and who was in the usual care group. So in research, usual care is basically you're doing whatever else you're doing for your depression, whether it's nothing, taking an antidepressant, or getting some other care. I want to call out here that um, a huge chunk of people, 72% were living alone. Um, we had uh, pretty good participation at the time from people of color. So at the time, there weren't a lot of research being done outside of kind of more white, wealthy, educated, older adults. So 42% identified as a person of color. And in this particular study, it was largely folks who identified as black. Um, people had on average 4.6 chronic conditions. So these were people living with multiple comorbidities. Um, um, and that's an important piece because we know that people with multiple comorbidities have have other health impacts because of depression. So when we can treat their depression, we can potentially have other benefits. I'm not gonna show a lot of data, but this was the data that really put PEARLS on the map. So here you can see on the left-hand side that PEARLS participants who are shaded in blue compared to those usual care participants um, really had a pretty significant drop in their depression score. So. When we look at depression, we look for a decrease by 50% or more. Here you can see it was about three, four times in PEARL participants compared to non-PEARL participants. On the right, you see similar outcomes for people looking at remission from depression. So they no longer um, meet criteria for, for clinically significant depression. So these findings is really what prompted us to say, oh, this might work. We should start doing this more because we basically saw really strong outcomes um, in terms of people's depression. So we next, for research, decided to look at a couple of gaps in that original study. So it was only with folks living with major or with minor depression or uh, persistent depressive disorder. So we wanted to see how does PEARLS work with people with more severe depression? Um, we also were curious about all age adults. Even though our focus was on older adults, what we heard a lot from the social service community is that some people are sort of functioning like older adults in their 50s or 40s, or they serve all age communities living with disabilities. And so kind of understanding the age was helpful. Then we also wanted to kind of see how much of an impact did pearls have? Like, did it, did it go away right after the, the study ended? Um, and I should say actually in the previous slide, um, we looked at outcomes both six months, so right after PEARLS ended, as well as 12 months, so six months after the program um, had stopped, to try to get a sense of how much of the benefits stick. And so likewise, we wanted to see with this next study, you know, how much do the benefits stick? We hope they do because people are learning tools, but we also know that you're doing a lot when you're in their homes. And we focus on people living with epilepsy because it's such a high co-occurrence of depression. And also, let's be honest, there was a funding opportunity that specifically um, gave us an opportunity to partner with this community. So sometimes you do research because it's a need, and sometimes you do research because there's an opportunity to have funding to do research well. So I think that's somewhat has driven some of our research to date. So in this study, um, it was a slightly smaller group, but you can see that about 70% of people had major depression. So this really gave us an opportunity to look at PEARL's impact with more severe depression symptoms. Um, and you can see this study, um, I actually, I didn't report in the last slide, but more people here were taking antidepressants. So uh, about 40%, which is not surprising given that antidepressants are often the first line of treatment for people living with major depression. Some people had also uh, about 28% had received counseling in the last six months. So here, this is the only data slide I'll show for this study. Here we see that while people in the usual care group, these are people who maybe had no treatment or were taking an antidepressant or seeing a counselor, their depression stayed pretty similar over the course of the study. So it's six months of 
of, you know, comparing to active pearls and then up to 18 months follow-up. Meanwhile, pearls started out actually more depressed, the pearls group, but then over time, um, they dropped pretty significantly at six months when pearls ended, and then they maintained those improvements up to a year after pearls, um, the pearls active intervention had ended. So one thing I want to call out about this original pearls research, which were both randomized control studies, which means that basically people were like flipped a coin when they engaged in the study to either receive pearls or something else. So this is meant to try to create like comparable groups to compare pearls to. But what we saw with antidepressant usage was different in this research. With the first study, it was about a third of older adults were taking a medication at the start of the study, and about 15%, 13% changed their antidepressant during the course of pearls. So because the change was similar, we don't think that antidepressants played a significant role in their care and ultimately their improvement in depression. The story is different with the group with major depression with the all-age adults with epilepsy. Similar proportion of people were taking medication at the start of the study, but we saw quite a few people, about a quarter of the PEARLS group, changed their antidepressants, and only 3% in the usual care group changed their antidepressants during the study. This suggests to us that part of what PEARLS did was connect people to better medication care. Maybe they changed their medication, maybe they upped the dose. And so because of this, when you're serving PEARLS um, in when you're serving pearls participants with major depression, we, um, when we do training for coach training, we recommend considering whether antidepressant um, should be part of that care. Many of you are not at agencies where you can prescribe. We don't expect that to be part of your care, but just knowing and anticipating this might be part of the recommendation from your clinical supervisor. It might even be a conversation that participants bring up because they've been prescribed something and they don't know how it works or they don't feel great. They have a lot of side effects. So to sum up, in terms of looking at Pearl's impact, I just talked about really the two big initial effectiveness studies that looked at reduced depression as one of Pearl's impact. I do want to call out that we've done other research to date that shows effectiveness in different outcomes, and these studies were done on outcomes that matter to you all. So this is all research done with community partners who say, we want to look at these other outcomes because they're important to us, they're important to our community, and they're important to policymakers and funders who support this work. So in the trials I just studied, we did see an impact where PEARLS participants had greater quality of life. In the epilepsy study, we also looked at suicidal ideation or thoughts of suicide, and PEARLS participants had lower suicidal ideation. We've done some research recently because we often get asked about Pearl's potential cost savings or cost effectiveness. So we did research recently where we found that Pearl's participants had fewer hospitalizations and nursing home stays, which are both really costly health services, um, compared to participants who didn't do Pearl's but that also receive home and community-based services. We've also done research recently called Pearl's Connect, where we found some impact on Pearl's participants' social connectedness. So we looked at PEARLS participants over time and found that they increased their interactions, their satisfaction with social support, they reduced their isolation and loneliness. And then most recently we've done a study where we were looking at PEARLS being delivered with uh, community health workers, and one of the outcomes we found there was that PEARLS participants um, had on average two to three referrals to address their social needs. I also mentioned earlier there's a lot of other types of research we do to try to really help you all. How do we help pearls um, spread, adapt, scale, sustain? And so there's just a few examples here. We're going to talk about this more in later webinars. Um, but basically what pearls dissemination implementation research means is it's ways of partnering with organizations to make sure the program's still working, um, but really improve how it's working. So how do we do it better? How do we support you? How do we adapt it in a thoughtful way where it still works? So on this slide, on the left is an example of the partners that we work with to look at pearls delivered by trained promotoras. In the center is a project that we're working on currently where we're engaging folks like you to, to kind of be pearls ambassadors to share their story, to really have more diverse organizations adopt pearls as they see themselves in the work. 
Um, and then on the right is an example of as part of Pearls Equity where um, we're trying to come up with tools to specifically talk about how Pearls has been adapted to serve diverse communities. In this particular blog, this was about um, focus on Asian American communities. So Kelly Ann worked with several organizations to prepare this. So research isn't just journal articles, it's also presentations, it's also conversations, it's also blogs, it's also videos. So when we, um, when we used to talk about Pearl's research and training, we used to just talk about studies, journal articles, and stuff. But what we've heard from you is that the really best way to show Pearl's impact is to tell a story. So I'm not going to play this video now, but you have access to this. This is about a four-minute video that we recommend you playing at your trainings to share a Pearl story. You may have videos of your own, so please use those. But this is a real brief video that has several organizations and a Pearl participant sharing how Pearls has impacted them, how it's impacted their lives, their organization. Um, and Kellyanne put the link in the chat, and then the, it's a YouTube link that you can also just, you'll have it in the slides. So we kind of changed the training a bit where we used to talk about the evidence and um, demonstrate what Pearls looked like in like a 20-minute session. And what we heard from folks is like, they want to hear about the research, but they want to hear about it in terms of impact. And then they want to kind of do the demonstration later on in the training. So that's what we've done for you today. Um, and we look forward to hearing like, what, how does this, how does this land? Do you need more stories to share um, with your participants? We actually have a couple examples that we can share. And then we encourage you to capture your stories. Um, and if you're willing to share them, I think it's, it's like a picture's worth a thousand words. That's, kind of the way it is with pearls. You can show graphs, you can show studies, but really kind of hearing from people's lives um, is, is what's really powerful. So kicking off the training with that, and you could even show this video before you talk about the evidence, it's up to you. Um, but really kind of showing that impact as part of where pearls come from and why we think it works before you dive into the nitty gritty of what's problem solving and how do I do recruitment and um, what's clinical supervision and all that good stuff. The last slides in this section about evidence and impact are just to kind of call out and name what we mean by evidence, because I think this term is thrown out a lot. Um, and really with PEARLS and with other evidence-based programs, it's both that there's research showing program impact, that's the evidence base, and I've tried to share that research with you today. And then it's also having a program, like having, having a toolkit, having a training, having a website you can go to. It's, it's having support. And both of these pieces are key, and um, there, there can be critiques about kind of who the evidence is for, and so that's why I've tried to be really transparent with you about kind of who Pearl started with and who originally participated, as well as kind of who continues to be involved, and, and, and there are some gaps, and, and we want to be um, honest about those as well, and I frankly continue to partner with you to fill those gaps to, to really build the evidence across communities. So on our website, uh, I put this here, people in that you are training are often not just looking for the evidence-based program sort of stamp for credibility, but they're looking to get funding. So it can be really helpful to say that Pearls has been recognized by lots of different organizations because of our research, um, because this sometimes translates into policymakers and funders um, wanting to support the program in your community. So on, the, on our PEARLS website, you have a little bit more information about these agencies, and there's links actually to go to their website. But we put this here just so that when you're teaching, you can remind folks that there's some recognition. I will say also, um, I've been a trainer now for about 10 years, there are sometimes people in the room who are healthily skeptical about non-clinicians doing PEARLS. I'm just going to say it. So these are you know, people who are maybe trained psychologists, psychiatrists, who really questions, can people without that training do this work? And what we've tried to say is yes. You know, we've, we've done thoughtful training. We've done a lot of research. The clinical supervision model is designed to support you all to do this work well. But sometimes talking about recognition can help with some of those critiques that you might get from your training audience. So that's my last slide before we kind of wrap up and do some teach back. But that was that was a lot, right? So, so what, what questions do you have about Pearl's evidence and impact? Are there things I didn't say that you expected to hear? Are there things that were confusing? How can I 
how can I help thinking about teaching quickly <laughs> uh, about 20 years of work, quite frankly, which is not an easy task, but um, you've got tools to do it well. I wanted to chime in um, since yeah. I'm fairly new to pearls. I, I think this is very helpful for me, like in just kind of stepping back and kind of diving in a little bit deeper than the two days that I had. And I can see how I can do things differently and, and approach it in a way where it's more um, fluid versus like, you know, checking off the boxes. Because sometimes when I feel mm -hmm. like when I'm checking off the boxes, it's not as personable or relatable uh, I'm trying to hit mm -hmm. this you know whatever it is and um I in the beginning when I first started I can feel the difference in how I first started versus today so yeah so thank you yeah. for this <laughs> oh thank you Sandy yeah I mean I, I do think um it's kind of hard to put yourself back in that day you were first getting trained um but it can really um it's a lot and so part of the trainer Train, train the trainer is to kind of synthesize and now you bring some wisdom from being in the field too as well. Um, there was something else I wanted to say based on what you said. Oh, the checking boxes. I will say running a Pearls training can also feel really rapid too. Like as the participant, it's a lot to take in. As the trainer, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to cover so much. <laughs> So one of the things we often use um, in training is we have a parking lot. So we like literally have a flip chart <laughs> where as these really good ideas are coming up or these really burning thoughtful questions and you just, you feel like you don't have enough time to unpack it in the moment. We encourage people to write on it. We write in it as trainers. We do our best to get to it over the course of the two day training. But part of why we do technical assistance calls is it's a chance for us to kind of follow up. So if you don't get to everything live, there's some follow-up emails. You can jump on the phone with your trainees. You know, there's other tools. So, so know that that checkbox tension might exist as a trainer, but that um, there's some things you can do to kind of make sure you cover everything, but then can do some follow-up. This is not your last discussion. Hopefully your trainees will be part of your community of Pearls and then join, you know, our community around the country doing this work. Yeah, great. Other questions? Okay, well, um, the last thing we're going to do today is a teach back. So you've, you've learned a lot today. You've learned about what is a train the trainer? What does an in-person training look like? How do you start it off? You know, how do you kind of provide an overview of pearls and set the stage? And, and what, um, what are some key pieces about pearls, evidence, and its impact? And so we're going to, the rest of our time today, um, we're going to have two of you teach us. Um, clearly, the first one describing the house, that was kind of one slide. I recognize that the second one describing Pearl's evidence and impact was more than five minutes. So whoever volunteers for this one, I just want you to describe Pearl's evidence and impact and what stood out to you. You know, what do you want to make sure when you're teaching this part of the training, what are the kind of three things, the five things that you really want to highlight about where Pearl's came from, its original research, and, and kind of what we've learned so far. Um, so who might want to volunteer for teaching these? And then I'll give you a moment to prep and think about what you want to say, and then we'll teach each other. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can see all you beautiful people. And you don't want to jump in. I'd prefer not to call you out. I'd rather have folks raise their hands. <laughs> and know if you do it today, you'll probably only have to do it one more time. So you'll get it out of the way. 
I'll, I'll talk about um, describing pearls using house figure. Oh, okay. awesome. Thanks, Naya. Thanks for jumping in. Gold yes. Star for first volunteer, sending you virtual chocolate. Before you start, though, who wants to talk about pearls, evidence, and impact? I'll try to do that. <laughs> Andy, awesome! Great. Okay, so this is how this works. This is the first time. Naya, you're just going to teach us. Um, we're all going to just listen very attentively and thoughtfully and, and paying attention. And then listen to what Naya does. Like, what does she do well? What do you really love? The words she used to describe something. And then when you're done, Naya, we'll just pause and give you some feedback. You can also ask questions. And then we'll do the same for Sandy. And then we'll wrap up for today. So Naya, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so when we think about what Pearls is, um, we're, we want, we're wanting to ask, um, ask our, our uh, trainees to think about the usual care. Um, so this drawing a picture in my head, um, having a clinician and a client sitting across from each other and asking them to think about what kinds of barriers this could create. So um, thinking about things like insurance, a big one, transportation, um, and then figuratively drawing a house around um, this clinician and um, this client and thinking about, well, what are the benefits of what this looks like going into the home of a client? What kinds of things um, are valued when we go into homes? What can we look for or how can we better get to know a client? Um, and this house kind of representing that pearls can meet a client where they are and to learn a little bit more about our clients when we can come into the home and deliver such a program to where our clients are. Awesome, Naya. What do folks, what feedback do folks have for Naya? Please. <laughs> I thought it was a really good description. Um, very concise. And I like how you're still kind of drawing it out, even in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I have a feedback. Naya, you're so brave to be the first volunteer, but also the way you described it, you explain everything so clearly. You speak clearly. You don't fill your descriptions with ums and ahs. Um, you get to the point. And also you incorporated like the imagination part of it, just like what Michelle said, how you said, I'm thinking, I'm imagining. And that um, me as a listener made me use my imagination to visualize what you're explaining. That was really good. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, Naya, I really like how you framed it as meeting, doing it in the home, meeting the client where they are. And at, at one point you talked about how being in the home allows you to see, to get to know the client better and see what they value. Um, and I think that was just really powerful. Like I, I could see myself imagining myself in, in anyone's home and, and just how quickly you get a sense of somebody when, when you're in such an intimate space. So, so you really painted that picture with, with those words. I thought that your voice and your pace was really good because I find sometimes that I talk too fast, but mm -hmm. you were smooth and steady and easy to listen to. Thank you. Yeah. And yes, thanks for jumping in. I know it feels weird, but this is a supportive group. And, and it, how do you feel after doing it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely nervous but, and just wanted to, I'm definitely not the first person to always jump in. So just wanted to try it because I, I do feel like this is a supportive space. So thank, thank all of you. <laughs> thanks, Naya. Yeah, thank you for modeling so well. And um, yeah, it's just a reminder. Sometimes you just got to get it out there and um, it'll be easier next time too. Great job.
Um, all right, Sandy, tell us a little bit, teach us a little bit about Pearl's evidence and impact. Man, before this, I wrote down all my notes and now I can't read my chicken scratch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> And I will probably have a lot of ums and mm. <laughs> but um, with pearls being an evidence based uh practice program, um, there it goes. Good, there it goes. My first um, uh, pearls isn't anything new. It's basically you know a way for us to label something, you know, that aligns with research where you know the funders have money for us. So with that being said, you know, it's a way to validate like what we're doing, and it helps us you know give merit to what we're doing as those who do not have professional degrees or anything like that, you know, when we come into the work, we have um, our life experiences and that really does make us really good coaches. And this is just a label that we're kind of placing on ourselves to show marriage um, with pearls. The impact with pearls is that, you know, the research shows that with the two groups, um, one being exposed to pearls, even though they started out having higher, um, levels of depression with PDD, or actually, let me retract that. Those who scored higher with, um, my goodness, I can't think. But anyways, those who scored higher on the PD PDD actually showed results that they actually did better after going through their pearls training, and they had lower rates of PDD. And the clients with the pearls education, they can pretty much lead a more sustainable and active rewarding life and I'm just going to stop there because I can't read the rest of my writing <laughs> yay Sandy thank you I so feel you about chicken scratch um thanks for jumping in that was a lot to cover and you did it beautifully um folks feedback for Sandy So since I work with Pearl's team, it's like literally part of my job to know all the research behind this. And I thought you did very well <laughs> for especially having like just heard it today. Thank you. I wanted to touch base that, you know, it was a program that was created for seniors and then research shows that, hey, you know, this actually works and aligns with other groups and cohorts as well. And there's ongoing research for that. But yeah. I really love, Sandy, how you named that these are things that people have already been doing in and with community for a long time, too. Um, I, I thought the way that you framed Pearls as a program and its impact felt really approachable and, and very clear in what it can and can't do. Sandy, I really like how you bring a transparency forth, you know, forthright, just very uh, honest about everything that you say, um, transparent in the knowledge that you learned in the short amount of time and the way you deliver it too. And I think that builds trust to the people that you are speaking to. Yeah, ditto to, to all that Kellyanne and Michelle and Jennifer shared, Sandy. I, I loved, oh, sorry, your voice is going out. <laughs> um, is that my voice or your voice? I'm going to assume it's yours. <laughs> I, um, I, loved, I loved how you, um, yes, I, I love how you located the evidence of what people are already doing, but that the research has provided a way to uh, share it more widely with funders and, and policymakers and gain more credibility. Um, and I loved at the end how you tied the improvements in depression to the what PEARL stands for. Like, like yes, their depression's gotten better, but as a, it's because they're living more active, rewarding lives. And I think that's a really important piece. We tend to focus on depression because it's a depression program, and we know depression has all those impacts. But tying it to the like why and what their lives look like now, I thought was really smart. And I I apologize for the acronyms. Um, I noticed you said PDD a few times, and I'm like, oh, that's me doing acronyms. 
You can just say depression. Some people will ask. I think you do need to cover the evidence around minor depression, the evidence around EDD or persistent depressive disorder, the evidence around major depression, which some people call MDD. But but you also don't need to put all the alphabet soup of acronyms. So I think just talking about there were significant improvements in depression, and then you'll have this handout that people can look at the specific charts and you can show the charts like I did. Yeah. So my apologies for the acronym soup. It, it can be, it can be a mouthful. <laughs> awesome. Well, Sandy and Naya, so great. I love, I love learning from you and I think the group did too. And thank you for jumping in first. That, that takes a lot of courage. Um, and I'm glad people feel supported um, after we just all met each other. So exciting to get to know you in the weeks ahead. Um, so let me just quickly talk about what's next because we only have a few minutes left in our in our hour together. Um, so or hour and a half together. So let me just a slide. Um, I'm not going to go into presentation mode because I don't want to use the time. Um, our next webinar is going to talk much more about kind of recruitment and eligibility. So we'll talk a little bit about what even is late life depression. What does that mean? What do we do for screening? You know, what are some of the forms we use? Why do we have the eligibility criteria we have? And talk a little bit about how you teach people to, to introduce pearls to a participant. So before next week, take a quick quiz. It's on PH Learn link. There's a quick video to watch to see how people have taught this in the past. And then there's the section on recruitment and screening in the toolkit just to refresh yourself, especially if you're not out in the field regularly doing that. Um, and as always, let us know if after today you've got questions, concerns. We'll make sure you get access um, to PH Learn Link. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. And I see Kellyanne in the chat is asking. Just let us know if any issues with accessing materials. There's other ways we can get them to you. If there's any hiccups with the technology, we don't we don't want that to delay your learning. Um, I will stay on for a few minutes if folks have stuff they want to bring just one on one. I'm happy to stay on the Zoom. Um, but otherwise, I just want to say thank you and applaud you for all your amazing work. Um, it's great to have you here. So excited about a new cadre of trainers. Um, and next week, I believe you'll be meeting um, Caitlin, who many of you know. Um, she'll be leading the training, I think, with Kellyanne. So I will see you in a few weeks. And um, then I'll miss you. But I'll be thinking about your teachbacks and look forward to catching you next time. Um, so thanks, everybody. Have an awesome Thank afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.